Kenny Holtzman. Roger Clemens won 354 games, but never did this. Tom Clavin had 305 victories, but never did it either. How about Robin Roberts and Whitey Ford? Nada. The great Bob Gibson won 251 games, struck out more than 3,100 hitters, and Bob managed to do it just one time. I'm talking about throwing a no-hitter in Major League Baseball. And tonight we honor, with induction into the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame, St. Louis and Kenny Holzman. Kenny did what only 25 pitchers in Major League history have done. He pitched two no-hitters, and he did it wearing a Chicago Cubs uniform. Ball three, strike two. Here it goes. Ground ball. Second up with it. The throw to bank. It's a no-hitter. It's a no-hitter for Kenny Holzman. Look at this. Oh, brother. It's a no-hitter for Kenny Holzman. Everybody on the edge of his seat here at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. Watch it now. Strike three. It's a no-hitter for Kenny Holzman. Uh, he did it again. Look at this riot down there. Look at this mob scene off the cup bench. Kenny Holtzman has pitched his second no-hitter. The Cubs win a one to nothing miracle ball game. A Hall of Fame performance by Kenny Holtzman. Look at this. Unfortunately for all of us, Kenny never pitched for the Cardinals. But September 19, 1969, Kenny pitched 10 innings and beat Bob Gibson and the Cardinals 2-1. to one. In the 10th inning, he retired Lou Brock, Kurt Flood, and with the bases loaded, Mike Shannon on a fly ball to center field. And we're supposed to like this guy? That win was one of 174 big league victories. He had two stints with the Cubs. The first one ended when he requested a trade after flamboyant manager Leo DeRocher allegedly made anti-Semitic slurs about Ken. He was traded to Oakland, where he had to endure owner Charlie Finley, who promptly cut Ken's salary. However, with Oakland on a staff that included Vita Blue and Catfish Hunter, Kenny excelled, winning 21 games in the 73 season and 19 in 1974. And in three World Series with those outstanding A's teams, Ken won four World Series games. He also pitched for the Yankees in Baltimore. When he retired after 17 years in Major League Baseball, he returned to St. Louis. So tonight we are honored to induct the pride of University City High School into the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame, Kenny Holtzman. University City, a dominant high school pitcher here in, uh, in St. Louis at U City. And Kenny, when you were playing high school baseball in St. Louis, it was really, really good, wasn't it? There were a lot of good players. A lot of good players came out of the St. Louis area, have been for many years. We even have some current players in the major leagues who came out of the St. Louis area who are the best in, in baseball. Um, I was privileged that I was coached by a former major league player, Ed Mickelson, who some of these people know, who was a former Cardinal in St. Louis Brown. And he introduced the idea of how you play at the professional level. So from an early age, I was indoctrinated to the professional style of play. At the time you went to college, not many players that wound up going pro went to college. Why, why did you go to college before getting drafted? I think it was always understood in my family that I was going to you know, try to get my education before I would try to play ball. And now that you mention that, there is an, I was surprised when I walked in. There's a number of my college teammates that showed up tonight. And I really want to thank you. I haven't seen these guys in over 50 years. That's great. And uh, that, that to me is a, as big a tribute as this is. I just want to say thank you to those guys. As a uh, sophomore, you were drafted in the first baseball draft in 1965, right? 1965, very first year of the free agent draft. And if you remember, the very first player chosen was Rick Monday from Arizona State. Seven years later, I would be traded for Rick Monday. I went to the A's, and as it worked out, it got me in all those World Series. Yeah. In, in 1965, Ken is uh, drafted by the Cubs, just blazed through their minor league system, and actually made it to the major leagues in the year you were drafted. Right. I think I was the first player in the draft that actually went to the big leagues. I got to there at the end of August in 65. Uh, one little note, uh, in that year I didn't pitch very much because the Cubs just weren't that good and I was actually throwing batting practice. I was the guy that threw batting practice on September the 9th in Los Angeles when Sandy Koufax pitched his perfect game. Our lineup wanted to see a left-hander 
during batting practice, mm -hmm. and I threw for a half hour. I walked off. The managers said, they didn't look like they were hitting you very good. And I said, well, if they're not hitting me, what do you see the next guy? <laughs> and, it, and 27 up and 27 down. And Sandy Koufax was your idol, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I got to face him the following year, his last year. Uh, so I'm the last National League pitcher to beat Sandy. And he lost in the World Series later. But, uh, yeah, he was my idol growing up. But, listen, I grew up as a Cardinal fan. I lived and died with the Cardinals in the 50s. Uh, there was a gentleman here, I know he left, Joe Cunningham. He's one of my boyhood heroes, uh, just like all the Cardinals were in the 1950s. And uh, I noticed the thread here that some players, uh, some athletes here were asked, what is your biggest regret? My biggest regret is I never had a chance to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. I mean, that was a boyhood dream. And yes, I played for the Cubs, and I played in a lot of World Series and All-Star games, but I would have loved to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. Did you think there was ever a chance? I asked Bing Devine that one day, a long time ago. He said, it, never, it just never worked out. He said, you know, you were on a situation where your present team needed you in that role, and we just couldn't make a deal. And I told him it was just a big regret. I always wanted to play here in my hometown. In 1966, Kenny Holtzman as a rookie has a really good year. Then in 1967, joined the National Guard. Tell us about that season. Well, I was in the National Guard, and I later got activated, put on active duty. But when I went to active duty and you go for your advanced individual training, you, you get a couple of weekends off at the very end. And the military and the major leagues allowed me to travel to where the major leagues were playing. And it seemed like every time I showed up, the Cubs would score eight or ten runs, and I wound up 9-0. and 0. And uh, it was just one of those magical years. In uh, 1969... The Cubs had a nine and a half game lead on August 16th. I think it was a five and a half game lead on September 5th. On September 9th, a black cat runs in front of your dugout. Did you guys realize what that meant when it happened? Well, obviously it was a you know a bad luck omen, but and I didn't realize the significance of it. But yeah, that was the beginning of the end for that team. You know, when I think back on it, that team was a very good team. There's four Hall of Fame players, Hall of Fame manager, but. After having been on Oakland and seeing what a real world championship team, I don't think that team depth-wise was good enough to be a consistent winner. Mm -hmm. we, we gave it, we were in first place for five months and then just gave it all away at the end. I'm always amazed by your era. Let, let me give you folks a, a run here of Ken Holtzman's start. So, uh, so the Black Cat happens on September 9th. September 10th, you go to Philadelphia, you throw, you throw seven innings. You get three days rest. September 14th, you throw nine and a third here in St. Louis. September uh, 19th, so four days rest, you throw ten innings against the Cardinals at Wrigley Field. So you have that. Uh, and uh, one other quick note here. In a span of eight years, Ken averaged 259 and a third innings, including 297 and a third in 1973. So what do you think about the quality start? Well, today that would probably be <laughs> child abuse, right, if a manager had a pitcher pitch that much. Yeah. But um, Marty Hogan mentioned it. You know, back then I used to play racquetball to try to stay in shape in the off season, and that, that helped me endurance-wise to pitch all those innings. There were a couple of years where I pitched 280, 290 mm -hmm. innings. That's unheard of today. Mm -hmm. But uh, racquetball used to help me, and uh, I used to play where Marty used to play. And uh, But times are different. You know, we would have three starting pitchers instead of five or six, and you were expected to pitch every fourth day. Did you ever have an arm problem? Never had an arm problem, probably, because I never really threw exotic-type pitches like sliders and slip pitches and split finger. I just threw a fastball curveball. We saw in the video that you were traded to Oakland uh, right before they went on their run of three straight World Series. Uh, you won 59 games in those three years. Uh, first of all, Ron mentioned that you had to take a pay cut. Did he have you uh, grow a mustache, Charlie Finley? Well, we were one of the lowest paid teams, okay? Even though we were so good, Finley didn't pay us. So one day at spring training, Reggie Jackson showed up with a mustache and a beard. And you're not supposed to have it. And Dick Williams told him to shave it off, and Reggie said, I'm not doing it. So now we have a team mutiny going to happen. Finley, who's the sh ultimate showman, said, you know what, let's, let's make this a promotion. If all the players grow a mustache, we're going to have a special promotion day at the Oakland. If you have a mustache, you get in for 50% off. And I'm going to give each player $300. 
And my roommate, Raleigh Finger, said, for $300, I'll grow a new leg. <laughs> I mean, that, because we, we, we just weren't play, and paid that much. So that's how that started. And, uh, of course, Raleigh's mustache became his trademark, and, and that's how it started. Did that A's team fight as much as we are led to believe? Well, you know, there have been many, many books written about the Oakland A's. I think at last count, 12 or 13. I tell people, you know, you always hear about championship teams have to have a certain chemistry in order to succeed. Well, we had chemistry, all right. It was explosive chemistry. <laughs> uh, we had guys who didn't like each other and were open about it. Um, somebody asked me the other day, could you think that your team was so good? Could you play today? And I said, no. They said, well, I'm surprised. You have four Hall of Fame players. I said, yeah, but we'd be suspended at the end of the first week. <laughs> we, we, couldn't, we couldn't stay on the field. We'd be suspended. Yeah. Now, we talk about tanking today. You got traded with Reggie to Baltimore. Were you still there when Charlie tried to sell Joe Rudy and Sal Bando and that gang? I was, on, I was already at Baltimore. Okay. Reggie hadn't shown up. He went home because his feelings were hurt. And <laughs> Finley sold Vida, Raleigh, and Joe Rudy, first to the Yankee, then the A's, two of them to the Yankees. For cash. For uh, $3 million. Yeah. And Charlie claimed that he was going to use that money to reinvest and buy a new team. When in reality, he just wanted to break up the team. He actually told us, we don't, I don't want you to win your fourth or fifth title in a row. Then i got to pay you guys, and I, I'm not doing it. So he said, well, I'll just get rid of us. I mean, he, at least he was honest about it. And, uh, but he tried to sell it. The commissioner voided the deal. They were returned to the Oakland A's. Me and Reggie wound up with Baltimore, later with the Yankees. And I wanted to move to that because the A's, and if you ever read about the swing and A's, it was a crazy team. But there are also books about the Yankees, specifically the Bronx Zoo. You move from the frying pan into the fire. And they claim that because me, Catfish, and Reggie were on that team, that we somehow, by osmosis, must have transformed the Yankees into the Bronx Zoo because we were on the Oakland Zoo. And so... But, it, we, you know, it was just a, I think because in New York it's overhyped because of the media, whereas in Oakland there's no press at all. So everything that happened in Oakland was legit. But in New York it was kind of overhyped. What was Steinbrenner like in those days? Not as bad as Finley, but close. Okay, mm -hmm. the players didn't really like him, but we were among the most well-paid, so nobody really had too many gripes. Mm -hmm. We traveled first class. If we needed a player, he'd go out and buy him. He didn't care. Uh, Kenny Holtzman, in addition to being in the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame, is in the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. How meaningful is that to you? Well, certainly. I mean, uh, obviously, there hasn't been a whole lot of Jewish players in the major leagues or in any of the professional sports. And, and you have more wins than any Jewish pitcher in history, if I'm I think, not mistaken. I, I yeah. played a little longer than Sandy. I think that's because of it. But... Um, you know, we try to set an example. I, uh, it's a big honor to be in the International Jewish Hall of Fame in Jerusalem. Um, but um, you try to set an example for kids. There's still a few left in the major leagues today, and there always has been a couple. When Sandy retired and uh, Art Chamsky and other St. Louis got to the big leagues, there was only maybe two at the most. Uh, and there's still some today, so, but it's, it, it was a very uh, inspiring thing to, to be. You went back and you wound up getting your degree. We mentioned you were drafted as a sophomore into baseball. You wound up getting your degree yeah. and wound up getting a master's. Yeah, later. Well, later I went to try to get an advanced degree. I wound up uh, being a supervisor here at the JCC in St. Louis for nine years where Marty started play. I really enjoyed that working with kids. Uh, I can remember one of my first days there, a guy named Albert Pujols walked in with his wife and his daughter who had Down syndrome. And because the J was one of the few places that would teach a Down syndrome child swimming lessons, him and I became very good friends. And we used to let him hit the batting cage. He used to sign autographs for the kids there. He's a terrific guy. And uh, so that's why I enjoyed working there, especially with special needs kids. And those sorts of things that you just described are what makes our town what it is, aren't they? You know, I told people I've traveled all over the world. I've lived in New York, Chicago, California, anywhere. I could live anywhere. I want to live here. And I'm in my later years now. Um, there's something about St. Louis that's extra special. It's not just sports. It's everything about the community. Like somebody said, they embrace their athletes here. But more important, the people are very honest and genuine. That's why I love it here.
Well, we're thrilled that you are now a member of the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Thank you. Kenny Holtzman, now of the St. Louis Sports Hall of Fame.